Can you hear me? I'm honored here this afternoon, but I must admit that if it wasn't for Trotsky and his ideas, I probably would not have been here. Now, I had the privilege of meeting Trotsky, and if I had to answer questions from comrades of how it felt to meet a man like Trotsky, and very frankly, I have to admit, it was like if you hadn't been home for a time and meeting your father, that is the impression I got, the warm feeling and the respect he had for some young workers. Not only that, though, no one ever asked me about the feeling of meeting Natalia. Now, immediately after I got a greeting from Trotsky, he referred me to his companion, Natalia. Now, here was a woman that went through hell and stayed next to her loving husband through thick and thin, through periods where parts of her family disappeared. No one ever heard of her. Practically every one of her family was disappeared, and we don't know yet what happened. And you notice the strike, the truck driver strike, Afton, after the strikes, and in 44, when we were sent to prison, the first wire I received was from Natalia, giving me courage to continue on to fight for the workers. Now we've noticed the film here this afternoon of the truck drivers and their battles. And that is what I am going to speak on at this time. Now, Minneapolis, Minnesota, lies in the center of five agricultural states. Wisconsin on the east, which is a dairy farming state. Iowa on the south is recognized as a corn country. That the two Dakotas was wheat and sugar beets and barley, mostly in grain. At the, at the north, of course, we have Canada. Now, we were in a deep depression in the 30s. The elevators were full of grain and merchandise. The, the stock farmers were actually digging holes in the ground and burying their cattle because they couldn't afford to feed them. There was one farmer, however, felt he had an exceptionally good herd, so he sent a truckload of cattle to the market just before Christmas, waiting patiently to receive his check so he'd have money for his children. Finally, after a few weeks, he received a statement from the commission houses stating, you owe the railroads the next number of dollars to cover freight costs. The farmer opened it and read it, sat down and wrote back, sorry, I haven't got no money, but I got more cattle. Now, Minneapolis was known as a scab town, and they had a powerful boss organization which called themselves the Citizens' Alliance. We started to organize the coal drivers after a year and a few months in February of 34. We were faced with an absolute no for negotiating from the employers. So there was nothing else we could do but strike. We called a strike in the middle of February, 
Unfortunately for us, with the weather turned cold, and the bosses sat there with tons of coal, and this was getting in February, they were getting nervous, and after three days of striking, they settled with the union the contract. This is the first contract that is signed with the labor movement since 1916, milk drivers won a strike. Now, immediately after we had won this strike and the word got out that the, the coal drivers won conditions, workers came up to the headquarters every evening. We had to put two men right in order. And these coal drivers says, we want to join that coal drivers union. They are the ones that prove that they have a democratic union and they know how to fight. So after several months of negotiating, and by the way, by then, we had at least 400 union members, 4,000 union members tied up, and the bosses continued to refuse to negotiate as you notice in the picture. Finally, we signed the contract. And it wasn't over a few weeks, and uh, again, the employers attempt to renege on the contract by stating that we didn't represent the inside workers or the warehouse workers. All we represented was the drivers and helpers. They got this idea, of course, from General President Tobin, who didn't like the way we were organizing, and we refused to go along with his policy of only of breaking up a union that was powerful. And our union was patterned practically from the C rather the CIO was started from the pattern of the drivers at that time. So we were forced out in strike after a month of negotiating without an agreement for they operate, the inside workers recognized the inside workers and the warehouse workers. So again, we were called out on strike. After several days, they were unable to get workers to come back to work. They were unable to move any merchandise. And Finally, they loaded a phony truck with merchandise and said that they were going to move this truck in spite of the Reds. I was sent out there as a picket captain, had about 4,000 pickets. We were unarmed. And the captain of the police came over to me and says, look, Devor, we don't want this mess in this town at this, at this time of the year. The tourists are going through, and we don't want this kind of mess. What do you suggest we do? And I said, very simple. All you have to do is pull these police away from these picket lines, and we will pull our pickets away, and that'll solve your problem. Oh, he says, I'd have to leave somebody here to protect this warehouse and this truck. So he, I said, okay, you leave a squad here to protect that, and we'll leave a squad here to watch that it doesn't move. We agreed went back to the headquarters, and I reported to the leaders there what we had done. Everybody clapped, and we felt happy. All of a sudden, we got another call that the police was again out at this warehouse district. This time, however, they were armed. I 
was ordered out to this time I had at least 7,000 pickets behind me. And we didn't more than get there. And again, I must say, we were unarmed, not even a club or a jackknife. And they began to fire. This warehouse had two floors, and there were policemen up on the, the floors and on the roof, firing right point blank at all of these strikers. As the picture shows, there were 87 of us were shot. Two of them were killed. After this scramble was over, the governor called out the militia. You'd get the impression, because he was the Farmer Labor Party and he was elected by the workers, that we would, the impression so shows that he helped get an agreement. Well, very frankly, we had a permit system that anybody that needed something in case of emergencies or so, they'd get an okay to deliver. Olson takes this permit system and starts issuing permits to practically anybody that said they wanted a, some merchandise. Results was the trucks was starting to move and under guard. So Ray Rainbow, who happened to be in charge of the permit, reported what was going on. And so we told the governor that either he takes his guards off the streets protecting these cab drivers that we would take hold. And he didn't think we would, but our pickets went out and battled even these guards. Of course, they didn't have no okay to shoot. So the result was that either the truck was tipped over or the driver got scared and brought, brought the load back. And that method then, Olson brings in some federal mediators and sat down with the union to see what they could do and what the problem was. And we pointed out, I say we, our negotiating committee at that time I was in the hospital, what the workers would have to have to satisfy them to a contract. mediators went back to the employers and again they refused. But then at least Olson sat down and put the employers and we finally got the contract and settled. And from then on we didn't have too much trouble with the employers. So if because Again, I say, we had a democratic trade union we, to further prove to the workers that they could come and they could have their grievances taken care of and would be taken care of instead of these unions that's controlled by the bureaucrats that stall them off and stall them off. In a lot of cases, the worker got discouraged and left. We appointed a committee of 100. By the way, I'm ahead of my story. They were appointed before the strike was settled. Of any grievance or any problem that arised, it was taken up with this committee of 100, and from there to the executive board, then the executive board reported what the action was, and the membership approved it. Now, there was a lot of cases where the workers felt that they weren't able to 
stand up in a meeting and explain their case, and in cases, and we understood a lot of workers aren't prepared to speak in a meeting where there's probably five or 6,000 people. So we set up a grievance board. I was appointed chairman of this board. So anyone, any member that thought he had a grievance or he did have a grievance, we took it up with him majority of the cases, we proved to him that he didn't have an agreement, but he thought he did if some other union member did this or that. But if we didn't, if he did, I would take up his case before the membership. And then the membership, thank you. Then the membership decided what should be done. Now, the last thing that Leon Trotsky told me at the meeting there that I attended with him in classes and discussions, he said, Harry, the trade union movement alone cannot solve the question, the problems of the workers. What we have to have as a labor party controlled by a democratic trade union movement. And what he meant by controlled by a democratic trade union movement was, and all of us here have witnessed what I'm going to tell you, there's been a lot of people elected to office. And after they got into office, they forgot who put them there and why. Now a <laughs> the Democratic trade union movement would have the power to discipline these men that we put on office. And then they would have the authority to take him off and put him back on the job wherever he came from, and another one would be appointed to take care of the problems of the workers. Now, I thought several times, you see, during the truck driver's strike and during the organization, we took up the slogan, Every member, an organizer, and make Minneapolis a union town. Now, the question of a slogan for the, the labor movement throughout this world we're going to have, I thought, you see, today, even in some of our Trotsky movements, we're going to have to meet. But everybody that says they are Trotskyites and organize these Trotskyites that are, that are real Trotskyites and have feeling for the workers to come up with a slogan such as that and organize the world workers. Now, in conclusion, I have to quote Mark. Workers of the world unite. You have nothing to lose but your chains. Thank you.